Hello and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Hunter Gatewood. I help manage the California Improvement Network for the California Healthcare Foundation. And we have a great session lined up for you today. Um, I'm going to do a bit of housekeeping and then we will, I will turn it over to our four speakers. So this is the second in a three-part series that we're doing. Hope you were able to join us for the top 10 uh, ways to get the most use out of your patient portal was the first in the series. We have a third coming up late February probably, date still being scheduled on e-consult and live video telehealth um, between primary care and specialty care. So have a good speaker, several good speakers lined up for that one as well. So please look for that and I'll tell you how to, how to make sure you get that notice at the end of today's session. Um, your lines are muted. You can use chat to ask questions and at any time, and we'll, we'll get to those later on. We have started a recording. Uh, we find that two or three times as many people as are able to join us live for the webinar like you have um, access to the recording of these webinars later that we do for the California Improvement Network. And you see there the CIN website uh, main address where you can access webinars, other sorts of resources that we publish as part of the activities of the network. Um, please use chat just to the host if you're having trouble hearing or seeing or logging in to part of the part of the discussion today um, and then for please um, please use chat um, and send it to all if you can um, to help us queue up all the questions we are going to go through the presentation and then save questions and discussion and your comments for the end but please give us those as they come up so you don't forget and we don't lose track of them we'll be doing some good q a um, towards the end of the hour here but ask your questions at any time. And last thing before I turn it over to our speakers, we do a quick three question survey about how today's session worked for you and also asking if you have ideas for other webinar topics or trainings, other events we can host as the California Improvement Network to make your efforts towards improving population health where you work um, more successful. So please uh, be thinking of that and look for the survey here at the end of the hour. So I will turn it over now to our speakers who will introduce themselves. We're very happy to have representatives from Inland Empire Health Plan, uh, the found California Healthcare Foundation itself, which has been sponsoring this work, and then also the Impulse Mobile vendor application that you'll be learning about. So take it away, guys. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hunter. This is Paige Mantel. I'm Senior Vice President of Marketing at Impulse Mobile. Very excited to join California Healthcare Foundation and the California Improvement Network for today's webinar. Uh, just a quick introduction to our company. Mpulse Mobile's healthcare solutions are based on a simple concept. Effective healthcare communications lead to higher engagement and activation. We offer a blend of data science, mobile messaging workflows, and dedicated account management with a HIPAA compliant enterprise grade platform to deliver solutions that help consumers engage in their health and wellness. Our goal is simple, engage people in conversations to improve their health, enhance their quality of life, and strengthen their relationship with the healthcare organizations that support them. For today's webinar, I'm joined by our, our fabulous customer, Thomas Pham from Inland Empire Health Plan. Thomas is Senior Director of Marketing and Product Management and a great leader driving wonderfully innovative programs and initiatives for IEHP. We also have Jared Teo from the Health Innovation Fund at the California Healthcare Foundation. Impulse is very proud to be a partner with CHCF and a recipient of one of their innovation fund investments. I also have my colleague, Heather Winters, a true mobile healthcare expert and lead on the IHP account, as well as many others. For today's session, what we'll cover is we'll start off talking about uh, the value and use of mobile in the Medicaid and safety net population. Uh, then we'll have Thomas share what IHP's business objectives are. Then we'll walk through a case study of an approach and result based on a three-month study we did with IHP. Um, from there, we'll talk about uh, solutions for providers, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, as we'll be discussing um, a specific research study we did with Inland Empire Health Plan that is also available for download if you wish, you can text the word Medicaid to the phone number 42039, uh, and that'll allow you to get a copy of that research study uh, directly. 
All right. And with that, I'm very happy to hand it over to Jared Teo to share uh, his views on the value of mobile for the Medicaid population. Thank you, Paige, and, and thank you, everyone, for the time today. Um, before I launch into some of the findings around the value of mobile messaging for Medicaid populations, I want to take one minute uh, to provide context for those of you who I haven't met in person or are not familiar with the work my team, the Health Innovation Fund at CHCF, participates in. Um, our goal is to accelerate the adoption and spread of technologies that are appropriate for the Medicaid and safety net population. Uh, we do this by spending our time in probably three main ways. Uh, first, it's understanding the priorities and needs of safety net payers, providers, and the population they serve. Second, uh, we spend a lot of time vetting and performing diligence on technology companies and eventually partner with uh, a few. And third, um, you know, we work with the selected companies uh, by introducing them to the appropriate safety net payers and providers. And so, you know, for some time, um, you know, we've been hearing from plans for a desire to modernize communications, develop a more direct and personal relationship with their members, and ultimately drive improved member engagement and health outcomes. So we spent a lot of time understanding the Medicaid population and their interaction with mobile. And, you know, I'll take a few minutes here to run through some of the insights with you. And next slide, please. So on this slide, um, we wanted to, to share an interesting insight. Um, so when compared to members with other types of insurance, uh, Medicaid members typically have the lowest activation, right? And so you know, I want to spend maybe a few minutes talking about what the uh, the, the activation means. So on level one, uh, means least active. It's, it's the least activated level. Uh, participation is generally labeled as passive and lacking confidence to play an active role in their care. Uh, level two is lacking basic knowledge and confidence in one ability to participate. Level three is someone who's able to take some action but lacking confidence and skill to participate in all necessary behaviors. And level four, which is the most activated level, uh, is, is described as someone that is um, is able to support the healthcare process, even though perhaps not able to maintain such support uh, in the face of certain life stressors. Next slide, please. So we also found that you know in the Medicaid population, chronic conditions and, and mental health issues were two times more prevalent, um, and, and usage of the ED was uh, twice as much. Now, obviously, there are many, many drivers of this. You know, however, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, the Medicaid population is generally less activated. Uh, they are less likely to take a role in the managing of their health and health care. And a key part of this is awareness of and taking action in relation to services that are available to them. So, you know, as you know, examples that we've heard in certain use cases are around, you know, when and how to choose a PCP, reminders about preventative screenings, um, and guidance and direction to free community health resources, and, and also including, you know, and also uh, encouragement to take advantage of uh, 24 hour nurse health line. Next slide, please. So, the, you know, there's really been a drive to use apps and portals, um, but, you know, one thing is those alone do not solve the problem for the majority of the population, right? I think um, in, in, in general, you know, portals and, and apps. Uh, are useful uh, sort of repositories of information, but uh, sort of, you know, generally is less engaging. Next slide, please. So the Medicaid population, uh, as we've seen, is actually quite active on their phones. Um, so here, you know, I have two sets of data. Uh, one is a large national data, but slightly a little older. Uh, and on the right is a smaller set of data, but from early 2016. Together, they indicate that you know, a very high proportion of the Medicaid population, one, owns mobile phones and suggests a trend of increased smartphone ownership, and that uh, smartphones are often tied with the sort of the, the primary way that this population uh, uses the Internet. Now, moving on to the next slide. 
So the, the Medicaid population actually has uh, you know, the highest usage of text. Uh, in addition, they typically have unlimited text plans, so there really isn't an issue with costs as there could be with uh, smartphone data usage. And the 98% read rate is a general industry figure, but what, what it highlights is the power of text uh, for reaching this population. And in order to do this and to take full advantage of this, there are several factors that need to be considered. You know, things like uh, a phone number scrub that identifies you know, which members have smartphones versus regular feature phones. Uh, knowing that smartphones are used for internet access, links to rich content can be sent. Um, you know, and, and however, you know, things such as data requirements do need to be considered as data plans may not always be unlimited. Next slide, please. And so now I'll turn it over to Thomas. Thank you, Jared. This is Thomas. Um, I'm from uh, IEHB, Inland Empire Health Plan. So, um, for the next slide, we go over you know who we are and what we try to achieve going through uh, the texting program. So, IHB, we are not for profit uh, health plan. We are the largest health uh, not for profit health plan in Inland Empire areas, uh, including Riverside County and San Diego County uh, of California. So, we partner with M Post Mobile since 2015. Uh, we contract with about 5,000 providers who provide services to our more than uh, 1.2 uh, million members. Um, our enrollment, our membership has been doubled uh, since the healthcare reform. So prior to healthcare reform, we, we were about 600,000 members. So right now we have a little bit more than uh, 1.25 million members. 98% um, of our members are Medicaid. So as you all know, Medicaid member a low income working family. Uh, the healthcare reform adding healthcare coverage to childless adult uh, or adult without minor children. So next slide, please. So we have been communicated to our members through uh, mostly through um, prior to 2015. Mostly we communicate to our member through. Uh, print material or telephonic, and even the brand new, you know, additional new member coming through the healthcare expansion, uh, the Medicaid expansion, and the changing um, in the technology. So, you know, we would like to increase our membership in terms of uh, the knowledge of IHB, how to get care with IHB, how to get all the benefits with uh, with IHB. Uh, for example. You know, do they know how to get care with their doctor? Do they know the option to get care after hours, like 24-hour nurse advice, like urgent care instead of go to ER? Also about, you know, some health tips, like the flu season. So we're sending text messages to let them know, hey, you should go and get a flu shot. Um, so we have some of the program to uh, increase their knowledge in preventive care, like mammogram annual checkup. So our goal is try to build, to increase our member engagement and, and activation in how they manage the health care. So uh, next slide. So a little bit about our member profile. So we have a little bit more female than female. Most of our uh, majority of, of our members are Hispanic. Uh, but you notice that only 25% prefer Spanish. So our population may be more like a second or third generation. Um, we, did, uh, we look at our phone database. Um, so we found about 66% of our members have uh, cell phone. And the other one is that we look at all of our members who actively utilize the online secure um, uh, member portal. 80% access their website through their cell phone. So, next slide, please. So when we, you know, thinking back into 2015, when we uh, were thinking about uh, who we should work with to uh, introduce the texting program to uh, our organization. So we went, we vetted through many vendors and, um, and, and, and found interesting approach from m -Post. 
So they're introducing the crawl, walk, and run. As you know, we just walk into the texting program. So like a baby, baby need to crawl, baby need to walk before baby need to run. So under the crawl campaign, uh, crawl approach, so I think that's the first year. Literally, we learn everything about texting program. Um, um, helping our staff feel comfortable with the program, get our member to be more familiar with the program, and try to get all our member opting into the program. So as of today, we have about half a million of, uh, uh, phone number in our active database. So after the year one, in the year two, we actually right now we're in the walking phase. So walking phase, we increase engagement through the two-way dialogue. For example, brand new member walking in, we say, we text to them to say, do you know, um, have you received your member ID card? Do you know how to find your doctor information on your ID card? So depending on the yes or no, we send an auto response to that. So if they respond no on the ID card, then we ask them to call us or go to online and download an ID card. Um, and then we literally is we bring the new member orientation into the text, uh, texting platform. Um, I would say one a year or two years from now, we would like to go into the run phase. This is where we use the text-based intervention for gaps in care. Such as, you know, if our database showing this member missing the annual physical or need a mammogram, then a text message will be sending out to alert and remind the member um, um, to, uh, to get the services. So I would say that um, we'd like to be in the run phase about a year or two from now. Uh, so far, we sent about almost 6 million messages. And total program, I would say 20. 24 to 30 program that we promote now. And our member really like the program. As you can see, it's very low opt-out rate per campaign. It's only the 2% opt-out per campaign. Oh, next slide. Now I'd like to hand over to uh, Heather. She's gonna go over the case study. Thank you so much, Thomas. So to give a quick intro, uh, one of the challenges that we face today is that newly insured members don't always use healthcare resources effectively, and that's usually more of an issue with low income population and those with language and cultural barriers. Our study with IEHP set out to prove that engaging members in a two-way conversation via text message can not only increase knowledge, but can also lead to much happier and a more engaged member. So a quick background on the methodology. IEHP was adding roughly about 15 to 20,000 new members and new mobile phones to the mobile program each month. We felt that that would actually be a perfect group to start with uh, to target with this case study. The control group started one month earlier and received the regular one-way communications from IEHP. And since IEHP hadn't done any two-way messaging to date, we compared the groups at regular intervals and analyzed things like click-through rates on URLs, sentiment, and that could be a negative versus a positive response to a message we sent, um, the engagement levels of the message, and then ensured that all messages we sent in the program were sent in both English and Spanish, depending on the language preference of the user. So a little background on demographics. Uh, we were really actually pretty lucky when we started out because IEHP was able to supply us with some great demographic data up front. That doesn't always happen when you start with one of these pilots, so we lucked out a little bit. But as you know, data isn't always correct. So people move, they change their preferences. So we needed to make sure that we had a tool that could adapt and to pick up on things and pick up on those changes automatically. So as Thomas mentioned with the population, one of the examples that we, we have today is with language. Um, since the initial member data was coming to IHP from an outside source, we found that language preference tended to be incorrect roughly 10 to 20% of the time. We found this out because when we sent our welcome message, welcoming members to the program, we would get some responses like, what is this, I don't speak Spanish, or English, please. Sending a message to a person in the language that they don't understand or prefer can really frustrate a member, obviously. So with our natural language processing tool, we were able to pick up on these responses quickly and automatically, uh, change members' language preference in real time, and then send them a confirmation text in the language that they preferred and understood 
um, giving them a heads up that it had been changed. This tool helped ensure that if members gave us feedback about a preference, we were able to listen and to adapt. So really the meat of this study was really embedded in our insight-driven workflows. Um, insight-driven workflows were, through, were used throughout the study to ensure that when we were sending messages to a member, it was, it was relevant and engaging. So we started the study, we wanted to make sure that the info we had on file, um, that we were able to customize it before, we, before it went out. We customized things like delivery times based off age, example being younger members don't like to get things during the day, the day when they're in school. So we would send certain messages to younger populations either on the weekend or at the end of the day to ensure that their responses were sent to them um, in a time that, that was best for them to read it. We also used member feedback or lack thereof to customize workflows as well. We would ask a question like, do you know how to get uh, needed care from IEH, IEHP? Excuse me. Please answer one, not sure, or five, very sure. Members that were highly activated, those responded with a four or a five, wouldn't get as many educational messages. They instead would get things like wellness messages or health challenges. People who responded with a one were automatically placed into workflows that would improve their knowledge of IEHP services. And like I said earlier, one of the biggest goals of this whole program was to improve the knowledge and ed educate members on easier ways to get care. We tried to ensure that they always had on-demand resources or easily accessible if they had a question. Some examples of that included, included um, if they texted the word nurse, they would get a message with information on the nurse hotline. If they texted the word urgent, our tool would calculate the five closest urgent care locations to their zip code and then send them a list of those urgent cares. Now, to go over quickly on some of the messages that we actually use throughout the study, you know, in a true engagement campaign really should utilize multiple messages, message types. In our study, we really focused on five main um, message categories. Um, simple one-way messages that could be either informational or could just have a little healthy tip of the day. Interactive polls to really drive that engagement, the engagement we were looking for. Uh, messages and alerting a member of on-demand resources available that they could text anytime, really just trying to train them to remember things like urgent uh, nurse or try for health challenges. And also health challenges and open-ended questions. Open-ended questions is really where we got the most feedback. That's where we really tried to see, to have a member answer um, in their own words and try to give us some feedback on where they're at, what they were having challenges with, and what they would like to see more um, from us. So I'm gonna actually walk you through two dialogues that we had with a member. These were real member dialogues that we had, and the first one we're, we're gonna focus on was actually only one month into the program. So it was a pretty, um, pretty great way to start. So the message said, just checking, if you feel sick and need advice, do you know how to reach IE, the IEHP 24-hour nurse advice line? Please text yes or no. This member replied no. Okay, here's another way to get the information. Just text nurse and we will reply with the phone number for the IEHP 24-hour nurse advice line. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So this is a couple days later. Uh, the member texted in, I have a lot of gas in my stomach, what can I use? And you can kind of see actually right in the message, they almost immediately remembered that they could use the nurse advice line. So they went ahead and texted nurse, we picked up on that and we were able to automatically deliver that uh, information to them on demand and in real time. So one of the main goals of this study was really to allow members to have that human experience without always having to have a human at the other end of the line. And since IEHP, like Thomas said, has a half a million engaged mobile members, our rules needed to be smart and they needed to be personal. So here is another uh, communication with a member. The, the conversation started, IEHP has been sending you five texts a month. Would you like to receive more messages, less messages, or keep it the same? Reply more, less, or same. They were fine with the cadence, so they replied same. That's great. We will keep sending you the messages and hope you're finding them helpful. Your efforts make me feel not alone. Thank you. You are very welcome. I still want to know who you are. You are a person and not a number, but all I know about you is 90902. 
So as you can see, the content was so personalized and immediate that they clearly made that it made it clearly made an impact on this member. And we've had members in various instances wish us Happy Mother's Day, Merry Christmas, and like this one, even let us know that they our efforts make them not feel alone. One of the most successful campaigns that we ran throughout this study was our health challenges. So these messages really encouraged members to do small daily challenges in hopes that these changes would lead to long-term habits. We would send, for example, a quick message asking a member if they would like to try a challenge. We tried to send these after work or at lunch so that they would have enough time to complete the challenge or in hopes that they would be at a time where they were having a little bit more free time. The member would text try and get a challenge sent to their phone. When they were done, they could text done and then the next challenge was delivered. So on average throughout the study, 10% of the members at least took a challenge with 33% of those members completing at least one of those challenge and many of them cycling through multiple challenges. So in summary, we took a group of 17,000 study group members and measured things like opt-out rates, which are percentages of subscribers that requested to unsubscribe after a message. Response rate would be the percentage of members who texted in a response to a member, tracking things like response time and time of day of the response. Our click-through rate for messages with links, percentages of members that would actually click the links. Um, the sentiment, which would be responses to campaigns, and then we would categorize them as either negative or positive responses. And then we also did an online survey, which we'll talk about in the next slide when we go over our survey results. So we'll walk through now some of the results of the study. So as you can see with this slide, the study results really speak for themselves. We had a 63% reduction in the intent to utilize ER for a mild condition like a sore throat or a stomach ache. And 91% of our members in the program felt that their knowledge about benefits and services at IEHP improved, which was really the goal we set out to obtain. We really wanted to make sure that people felt that they could access services through IEHP easily and really understood how to get there. And we had a 48% point reduction excuse me, in patients unsure on how to get care with IEHP. So really, as we were measuring things, you know, that, that really shows that we were able to make a difference with those study group members. Throughout the study, we relied on a series of surveys to try to understand how members were progressing along. One example was a question where we asked, that we asked at the beginning of the study and then again at the end. The question was, if you woke up in the middle of the night with a sore throat, what would you do? The purpose of this study was to gate, or excuse me, the purpose of this question was to gauge how members were currently utilizing services with IEHP. In the beginning, we frequently saw that members would choose an ER over a more effective channels like urgent care or nurse advice line. After sending some educational interactive campaigns throughout the study about cost saving and time saving benefits of these non-ER services, those responses shifted. And once the study was over, we launched a survey to gauge how and if the members' knowledge of IHP services had improved. So using a scale of one to five, members were able to rate the comfort level and understanding in key areas. These areas included understanding how to use the nurse advice line, being reminded about important appointments, and improving overall knowledges of IEHP services. So as you can see, most of the member feedback was extremely positive, and members scored the program on average a 4.3 across all categories. And now I'll hand it back over to Thomas to talk about the post-study efforts as part of their run phase. Yeah, so um, from the study we learned from the case study, so we applied that into uh, other program. So one of the achievements that we would like to highlight is um, um, promotion of our online member portal to our member. So before the texting program, we were able to bring in about 1,000 members a month. So after launching the texting program and learn, apply the lesson learned from the case study, we're able to increase our monthly site up rate uh, from two, three to 4,000 a month. So that's a very significant increase. And then also we send a message, more messages to our you know, member promoting nurse advice line. 
um, promoting the urgent care. Um, and we start introducing uh, some promotional program to increase the preventive care, like mammogram, cervical cancer uh, campaign. It's still early to, to, to tell the success of the um, uh, preventive care, but so far we see very positive direction. It's about 5 to 10 percent increase. So it's not significant yet, but we see a very positive direction on, on, uh, on, on, on the utilization of um, um, preventive care program. So, next slide. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, thanks Thomas. Uh, this is Paige again. Um, so we just spent um, time talking about IHP and their use of interactive text messaging for a health plan uh, and interaction and engagement of their members. Um, since I know this audience also is full of providers, I wanted to highlight some key areas where interactive texting helps uh, through uh, helps providers in some of the use cases that we have here. So um, our patient engagement solutions cover the care continuum. We have three broad solution areas. Uh, we have over 50 in-market use cases relating to these uh, with customers like Kaiser Permanente, Mayo Clinic, uh, UCLA Health, and others. So the patient, uh, the population, and community health focuses on solutions that target specific populations to drive healthy behaviors. For example, uh, and similar to what Thomas just highlighted, the gaps in care uh, around preventive screeners, reminders to get flu vaccinations for at-risk populations. Um, within care coordination, we include appointment reminders and pre-surgery messaging discharge instructions. Anything that focuses on getting patients to specified care events on schedule and with necessary preparation, and then delivering content post-procedure as they transition into their homes and complete their care plan in that environment. So let me go through an example of, uh, of mobile in action in a workflow. So let's talk about a procedure. So in this example, we have a woman named Jennifer who is going to be having knee surgery. So let's follow how we can use interactive text messaging to help Jennifer both be prepared um, for that procedure, help her family during it, and all the post-care recovery. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can see this, uh, see a very detailed demo in action on your phone if you want to text the keyword knee to that same code I gave you before, the 42039. So well, let's walk through what we have here on the slide. So Jennifer has a mobile phone. She uses apps. She uses texting like 94% of adults. Um, she has her surgery. It's scheduled. She gets a text message that gives her all of the pertinent information on the time, the location, when to show up. Um, two weeks prior to the procedure, she gets messages that help her uh, prepare for her procedure, including um, a text with a link to the portal to complete the pre-procedure questionnaire. That helps free uh, nurse staff from uh, doing the calls and allows Jennifer to do it at her convenience, which is really important and very consumer-oriented. So two days before the procedure, uh, Jennifer will receive time-based reminders about pre-procedure pre preparation. So for example, uh, sending her a note at around 7 or 8 p.m. reminding her to not drink or eat anything other than water after midnight. So all of those time-based um, procedures that in today's world end up being a lot of paper printouts or emails that are maybe a little bit more hard to follow uh, and complex, being able to send text messages at the right time um, help remind people to stay uh, fully prepared so that when they do show up for the procedure, they are completely prepared and everything goes as scheduled. So on the day of the procedure, uh, we continue to support um, the family members that have brought Jennifer for that surgery so that they know and they feel informed about the process. So we can send messages to them, letting them know that the surgery is complete, uh, that Jennifer is now in the waiting room, and that now Jennifer is ready to be taken home. At point of discharge, Jennifer and her caregivers uh, will receive text messages with links to complete post-op instructions. So that helps reinforce all of the post-operative care that she needs to take and be responsible for. 
so that her knee continues to heal and the effects of the procedure um, are effective. So all of her um, home care plan items can be sent via time-based text messages, including reminders about medication, any procedure care instructions, uh, and follow-up physical therapy appointments. She can also receive messages on follow-up appointments to check back in with her orthopedic surgeon to ensure proper healing is happening, um, to ensure that all of her care is taken care of and that she is a satisfied patient. So in summary, uh, we've talked about a number of different ways that interactive messaging can help drive healthy behaviors, both in the plan and in the provider. What I want to spend just a minute on is looking at this framework. This is, this is our framework and our vision for how to drive um, the most efficient and effective uh, activation and healthy behaviors in your consumer base. So the first layer is this communication layer. That's focused on being able to deliver a large volume of messages. Um, they need to be reliable. They need to be secure. Um, for healthcare messaging, of course, it's critical that it's HIPAA and TCPA compliant. Um, so that's a big part of, of our platform and a big part of the commitment we make to our uh, security standards and to our customers. That next layer, the engage layer, is all focused around driving uh, engagement and dialogue because that's how you get m more engaged people. Um, they feel like they're being listened to, as in the example Heather shared, um, and they're responded to when they ask questions. The opportunity at this level is to automate that interactive workflow across whole populations. It requires the effective message delivery and the ability to respond automatically and in real time to those inbound messages. Once consumers are engaged in a dialogue, we get to that third level, that activation level. And this is where content and experiences are targeted to their unique needs to their demographic information, to the way that they've responded. Um, this layer is focused on using analytics and insights about individuals to tailor that workflow. So for example, as Heather described, knowing how to send different messages at different times with different content for different age groups is really important. Also based on the information we get back from them, based on their current knowledge uh, and activation level. So medication population insight. So if we go back to what Jared highlighted at the top of this webinar, uh, the Medicaid and safety net populations are some of the highest mobile users. They use their mobile phone for, for more than anything. They actually text two times more than non-Medicaid populations. So they're very high and active on text messages. It is a great way to engage with them um, and, and highly effective both um, business efficiencies and cost efficiencies. Um, they'll engage in dialogue through two-way texting and they really appreciate being listened to. Um, and, and that interactive messaging helps give them the knowledge uh, and empower them to take the action to improve their health, uh, keep their families healthy. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, I think to, to Heather's point earlier, utilizing different messaging types provides richer insights so that you continue to develop uh, deeper and more tailored messaging to the person level. All right, with that, um, I'd love to hand it back over to Hunter for questions. Um, if you want to take a moment to put your questions in the chat um, box, if you haven't yet, just a reminder that if you're interested in getting the full download report on the IEHP research study that Thomas and Heather shared today, uh, you can text the word Medicaid to 42039. You can also visit our website at mpulsemobile.com. We have a resources page that has this study and many other resources if you're interested. Hunter, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thanks, Heather and everyone, for the great presentation. Um, yes, please, everyone, uh, chat in your questions now. Lots of different uh, use cases and benefits of texting programs, both for health plans and for provider organizations were discussed. I'm sure you have questions. I have a few. Um, we also will be, I, we will email out from the CIN, we'll email out a link to the case study um, as, as after, the, after the call for all of you who are, who are registered and attending here. So um, please let us know your 
questions, please chat in um, what you're working on, how you've used texting if you have, how you would like to use it and get these experts' advice on your plans or potential plans, your hopes and dreams for using texting to work with the people that you serve. Uh, that would be a good use of this time. Or, you know, to ask Thomas about how things are working, you know, more details about the what they've been able to accomplish at the Inland Empire Health Plan. Okay, no questions have come in so far, says Helen at the foundation. So I've got a question. Um, do you know, this is mainly for Heather and Paige, well, for all four of you, like as Jared and Thomas may have insights too. I'm wondering about texting solutions that help bring together the patients and the health plan like you've talked about and you've talked about the and then the patients and the providers is there are there solutions practices ideas for bringing all three of them together for example if i'm if i'm going to urgent care and i'm utilizing that through the good communication and resource matching that the health plan's offering like in the inland, inland empire work um, does that with that information is there a way for that to flow through to my primary care provider so she knows that I access urgent care? Or happy news would be, hey, these are your 10 patients um, that we, you know, that, that are Inland Empire Health Plan members who you see in your primary care clinic. These are the 10 folks who are doing a who are doing the health challenge with us. Um, that would be happy stuff for the providers to know. Any examples or ideas about that? Um. I'm trying to think. I think um, there might be some examples uh, with Kaiser Permanente um, doing that. Heather, you have any? Yeah, we've done some good background with Kaiser just because we've got such a great way of integration, integrating with their um, internal systems. So we're able to have that data and be able to push it to to people, the interested parties, right? So the providers, the patients, um, sometimes like Paige outlined, even the patient's family in the mix of things. So. Um, so yeah, as long as we can have, I guess, all parties involved and integration makes things much simpler um, to be able to push that data to the people that are interested in seeing it. That's great. That's good. And of course, Kaiser has some advantages over other other systems, other organizations um, in connecting all those dots, but that's, that's wonderful. We do have a question in from Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. She wants to know, for the IHP work, when you started your texting campaigns, the different programs, how, what was the frequency of the contact? And then also she's asking, how did the plan get member consent for the text messaging? Good question. Yeah, so this is Thomas. So for IHB, uh, we use the, um, the opt-out approach. So like Heather mentioned during the presentation, uh, we send an initial text uh, to the member and say, hey, IHB introducing the new texting program um, uh, text backstop if you don't want to participate in this program. Um, and, 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 and through that opted out approach, uh, we would be able to retain or, or enroll most of our member in the program. So at originally we fear, you know, we have concern about high opt out rate, but then going through all the campaign, the opt out rate is very low. Two percent, and we have me, we received many positive feedback from uh, from the member. And right now, they not only texting back to the program, like and engage through our two way engagement. They text back to us, uh, asking about uh, how to find the doctor. You know, it, ask all their uh, healthcare related questions as well that we we'll able to triage uh, with uh, the right department to get that answer. Um, on the campaign, so depend on your strategy and depend on the goal. So for for example, um, I would like to highlight our member portal. So pushing the member portal, we use the approach I call more targeted approach rather than the frequency. That's how we started originally. Originally, when we start with uh, the member portal, we send the message um, three times uh, to make sure that they get it every other month. And then we're getting smarter, you know, through the case study and through uh, what we learned during the um, the crawl phase. So when the member call us, uh, call to the member services, asking that I want to change my doctor, 
So a week after that, you know, a couple of days after, within the same week, a text message sent to their phone and say, hey, thank you for calling us to change your, your, your doc, but do you know you can um, you know, change your doctor via the member portal as well? And then, you know, it, it, so we route them to the member portal. So originally when we do the mass advertising like that, we're able to get like 4,000 sign up a month. Now we go, to, you know, and, and you, as you can see the database, it's half million phone number. It, 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 it's significant and it's more expensive. So going through more targeted approach, we only tax out, I believe, about less than 30,000 a month. Uh, instead of half million a month, and we're able to get 3,000 people sign up. So it's more co more effective if, if the campaign is more targeted um, to the right people, right individual. Hope Great, that thanks, answers the question. Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, Kristen, let us know if you have more follow-up questions or if anyone else, if that triggered additional questions for you or anything else you want to know about the all the possibilities through through texting. Thomas, can you list again a few of the a few of the programs or a few of the targeted um, kind of targeted populations you've reached out to? I know you I know I think I saw there were twenty of them. What some mm -hmm. of them So the other one for example went on member on hold. So the eligibility is on hold because they need to uh, um, um, uh, complete that paperwork with the county Medi-Cal eligibility worker, Medicaid eligibility worker. So a um, text message sent to them and let them know that they are on hold with us. So they aware and, and we send the phone number to that the, the, the cell phone as well. So they have that phone number so they can call that eligibility worker. Um, Another one, we um, um, uh, preventive care. We talk about diabetes, um, mammogram, uh, flu, annual checkup. So even though we don't we don't promote uh, we don't uh, include the PHI in the text our, our text to the member, but it's very targeted because we we send that message to the list of individuals who we know that they haven't had a mammogram. So instead of say, do you, you know, go and get your mammogram, but we are message more about, do you know mammogram, having annual mammogram will help you prevent new cancer. Go get now, if you, if you haven't get one yet. So, um, um, so we're able to be creatively and go through that without display PHI uh, on the text messages. Um, oh, we do a lot. Point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the new member orientation, so there's a whole formula that we set up for a member newsletter, um, member orientation. So instead of going through the print material and educate our member through you know, that journey in that first three months, uh, three to six months with IHP, we use text. So we walk them over from the ID card, PCP, nurse advice line, urgent care, uh, getting care with the specialist, uh, pharmacy, behavioral health. So we bring the whole new member orientation into texting uh, platform. That's fantastic. Okay, we have another question from also from Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. How did you collect mobile numbers for your members, and what was the time frame for that collection? And then, what are how accurate are these numbers? What percentage of them have you found to be wrong numbers in doing your campaigns? Good, good question. Because um, when we get data from state. They don't tell us the number is a landline or mobile. So we work with Ampos, uh to scrub all number we have in our system, yeah, that our member have in the system. Then we able to identify through that phone scrubbing, we able to identify if the landline or it's mobile phone. And also we able to tell which phone number is smartphone versus non-smartphone. Because for example, we have a member app we only promote member app, uh, the, uh, our app, to the member who have smartphone. So um, uh, you're able to, to, um, to identify the phone number through the phone script. That's great, thank you. And we have a question from Erica. Thanks, Erica. Do you send links, pictures, et cetera, or just, uh, just text? 
free to all time. So we do have a um, uh, short messages, um, uh, um, and then um, depending on the topic, we send link to a video. We do a lot of video, and we also send link to a web page. Um, so we do all sort of thing depending on the resource that we have, and depend uh, and depend on the the topic that we we promote. Uh, for the how to, like uh, how to get care with IHB, how to get benefit with IHB, we find that our member um, um, more in tune to the video approach. So we send them a link to the video that we develop, and and that video is in the YouTube. Um, so that's great. Thank you. Um, let's see, Jared, Heather, Paige, anything to add to those? those responses to those good questions? I think Thomas did a phenomenal job covering it. <laughs> I agree. I agree. All right. Any more, any more questions from the participants listening in? Thanks for those good ones, Kristen and Erica. Okay, no more questions coming in. We can, let's see. Why don't we move to wrap up then? We'll just end a few minutes early. We have one more slide here if you're back on the screen with me. Um, so this has been a production of the California Improvement Network. I want to thank the presenters again. Um, know that the recording will be up um, in a few days on this uh, website, the web address here. Uh, chcf.org slash cin slash webinars have all sorts of recordings from past topics including the portals webinar that was the first one in this series and other ones on let's see we had uh, perinatal maternal mental health uh, we have a two-part series on transgender health best practices and resources we had one most the most recent one for our uh, alternatives to face-to-face -face visit series was about the total cost of care and measuring and improving that uh, so lots of different topics applicable to your work uh, if you haven't if you weren't with us for those or haven't accessed those they're there the third uh, like I mentioned at the top of the presentation today we're going to do one on telehealth and e-consults it'll be the end of February or the first part of March um, there's also on the CIN webpage um, for the webinars listed there's a ongoing series for all of the providers in California who are looking at options to help uh, help with the opiate addiction crisis going on in the country. There's a lot of uh, clinics and um, on the commercial side and the, pri and the primary care safety net side working on medication assisted treatment. So CIN has funded a monthly webinar series. So the recordings for the past ones are, are posted with an option to get continuing education credits for those or to access them free with no credits. And then there's also ways to register for the ones coming up. So good series. Another one is the next one is happening tomorrow at noon. On that one, um, we have uh, the partner reports. Part of the California Improvement Network is a group of dedicated 15 organizations across the state. Um, they are IPAs, large FQHCs, um, nonprofit clinic consortia groups, um, county delivery systems, and Medi-Cal health plans, including IHP, are the 15 partner organizations, and they come together a few times a year and talk about specific topics and get expert expert speakers and as well as consult among themselves. The most recent topic was developing effective community partnerships between primary care and community organizations that work on things like food access, housing, education, and jobs. Um, and, and there's a partner report on that. How do you manage those partnerships and make them productive for the populations you serve? So that's also there on the CIN site. Um, if you're not um, familiar with the CIN and you're not getting our monthly newsletters about all these different events that we offer, like today's webinar, um, please join the network. Just go to chcf.org slash CIN, and then there's that little button on the top upper right-hand corner of, the, of that main homepage for the CIN where you can sign up, and that will make you a member, and you'll get our newsletters, and you will never miss, never miss a resource again. So let's see, there's one more comment. Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, the okay, so Erica is asking. There are another couple questions that came up, so let's cover those real quick. 
Erica asked um, Thomas, can people contact you um, at the health plan um, as they launch their texting program? I'm not sure where Erica works, but she works somewhere that, that they're going to do a texting program. Um, Thomas, are you okay with your your uh, your information being shared? Um, sure. Yep. If you want to learn more about our texting program, you can contact me the email. And um, okay. Okay. Great. Oh, so thank you. So Erica's at uh, Miller Children's Hospital in Long Beach. So they're working on texting. That's great. Good timing. And then uh, Kristen's asking, can you please, could you please follow up with this last question after the webinar in an email? I think is that referring to? I think that's referring to Thomas's Thomas's information. So yeah. So Kristen and Erica, I'll make sure that you have Thomas's Thomas's email address now that he's given us his permission. I'll send that to you because I have your your information too as you register for the for the webinar. All right. Any further questions or comments from our um, from our participants or from our speakers before we before we wrap up a couple minutes early? All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Um, please look forward to coming events, including the recording of this webinar that you can promote to your friends and family and colleagues. Um, and again, thanks to Paige, Heather, Jared, and Thomas for being our presenters today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice, have a nice afternoon, everybody. Thank you.